Hey, everybody. Yeah, thanks, thanks for everybody. Thank you. Um, thanks for taking away uh, your time from full day TV analysis of the big game. Um, let me say a special thank you to Priscilla for bringing the purple. Um, someone needed to do it. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. I know. I'm just saying <laughs> we're here. Somebody needed to bring something related to the Ravens, and Priscilla did it. Thank you. And they're delicious. Delicious donuts. Um, I want to say I appreciate your sacrifice for being here. Um, since so much of the programming that's on right before the game or hours before is so vital. So I just want to fill you in on what I believe is happening right now on the television. Um, first, there's going to be Ray Lewis in an interview, and then they'll cut to him crying during the national anthem two weeks ago. Uh, then there'll be a half hour in depth personal biography of the 49ers quarterback who has the arm tattoos. Uh, then there will be 17 mentions of the fact that the two teams' coaches are brothers. And then finally, two quick photographs of Joe Flacco. So, do you guys feel like you're there? All right. Let's, let's pray again. Let's pray. Gracious God, make in us a home for your love. Give us grace to bridge the divides between us. Strengthen us to love when it is difficult. Open our hearts again to your transforming spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. So our text today is one that could sound very familiar if you've been to many weddings. It's definitely a classic wedding post. Uh, so maybe I should have switched it over to next week when it's closer to Valentine's Day. But I didn't. This is when the lectionary has it. Um, and in some ways, this letter from Paul does read a little bit like the Bible's rules for marriage in a convenient 13-verse package. Right? But the original recipients of this letter, the Christians living in the city of Corinth, were two crazy kids in love, but a church community trying to figure out how this new way of life that Paul had taught them about was supposed to work. In the chapters before our reading, Paul has been answering questions the Corinthians had sent to him. Uh, we don't know exactly what the questions were, the part's been lost, but he does a lot of advising and expounding, scolding and explaining about the various intricacies of life together in Christ. Is it better to get married or to stay single? What is communion supposed to be like? What about spiritual gifts? And at the end of his exposition on spiritual gifts, Paul closes with the greatest gift of the Holy Spirit, which is love. So in the reading, Paul starts by comparing love to other spiritual gifts, speaking in tongues, prophecy, knowledge, faith, generosity, even self-sacrifice as a martyr. None of these, says Paul, compare to the spiritual gift of love. Okay, Paul, you've got my attention. Those things you mentioned seem pretty cool to me. I would be impressed if somebody could speak the same language as angels, right? Or if someone had enough faith to move a mountain, or sold everything they owned. And you're telling me love is better? Go on. Um, all right. Sorry, that's my imaginary conversation with Paul. Go on. But then here's the part that gets under my skin. Paul describes love, and his description might be useful. It probably was very useful. If you're trying to sort of corral a bunch of unruly Corinthians to settle down and treat each other right. But after a couple thousand years, it's starting to sound a little cliched, or actually, more to the point, impossible. This patient, kind love that Paul is talking about is so polite and flexible and never irritable or resentful. This love that rejoices in the truth, this love that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. That amazing love doesn't seem like something human. Who doesn't get irritated sometimes? Even with the people we really love, much less with folks who we only somewhat like, right? Who doesn't feel resentful every now and then, or maybe just a little arrogant? Who doesn't get impatient? Let the person who has never honked at the car in front of them at the light when it turns green and they still have a gun, let that person be the one to cast the first stone. <laughs> and the thing is that, well, I haven't, when I was driving the Buick, I didn't because I didn't have a horn on my car. So maybe. <laughs> that doesn't count. That doesn't count. Right. No. If you don't have a horn, it doesn't count. All right. And the thing is that, in some ways, this love that Paul describes is not human, it is supernatural, it is a spiritual gift. Something that comes from God, not from our own determination. 
Love that draws only on our human strengths and emotions has certain limitations. We may hear these words read at weddings. We may hear love never ends. And as we look at the beautiful bridal dress and all the flowers and the few bows and be reading the words, we're reading the words as a blessing, as instructions full of hope with our fingers crossed, but not as a description for certain of what is to come. I'm not trying to be pessimistic, but just to point out that human love, as we know, has its limitations. Sometimes love, or what we think of as love anyway, does come to an end. But Paul says love never ends. This is a gift from God that outlasts everything else. Of all the spiritual gifts, love is the one that lasts. Prophecies get fulfilled and set aside. Languages change or pass out of existence. The thing you thought you knew gets turned over by the next wave of knowledge. Nothing stays the same. But love is complete and will persist even into the next world. Now, I'll say I don't always think of Paul as a mystic. His writing seems so logical. It seems logical, anyway. It seems so explanatory, so complicated, um, so intellectual, that it's hard for me to imagine his, him as someone who dreams dreams and visions <coughs> visions. But really, what he's telling us about love is mystical. This love that has God as its foundation is the thing that will last from this world into the next. We may be like children now, doing our child activities, thinking our child thoughts. But when the time comes, we'll grow up. And the change will be so vast that we'll barely be able to remember what it was like to be a child. And yet, love will persist through that change. From death into the next life, love will not end. Right now, we see only dimly what the new world will be like. It's like seeing a homemade video on YouTube. You only have a limited field of vision of the cat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not always a cat, sometimes it's a dog. But imagine the difference being there in person. We have the video now, but we'll be in person then. And the thing we'll see most clearly is love. Love does not end, says Paul. God's love is the thing that matters. God's love is the thing that persists. We come into this world alone, and we leave it alone. Except that God is with us the whole time. Everything else in life is changed. So what do we do with this? What does it mean that love is a spiritual gift? What it means is that we should treat love like a gift. Give thanks for it and treat it well, cultivate it. Give thanks for the moments and the days that God gives us the strength to live and act in love. Give thanks for the people we meet who surprise us or who reassure us with their love. I think a quote from another letter writer in the New Testament is order, in order here. In 1 John, the writer John tells his community, Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is the foundation of love, because God is love. Let's listen to Paul's letter to the Corinthians one more time, but with an important substitution. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have God, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have God, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have God, I gain nothing. God is patient. God is kind. God is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. God does not insist on her own way. God is not irritable or resentful. God does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. God bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. God never ends. May God's spirit and God's love abound in us through Christ our Lord. So let's have some time for reflection, and then we'll move into community conversation.